all stand, please. Uh, Lord, thank you for allowing us to come together to do the work of the Cherokee people. As we do that work, help us remember the least among us, our brothers and sisters. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, Curtis now. Here. Frankie Hargis. Present. Bill England. Here. Jack Baker. Here. Joe Bird. Aye. Julia Coates. Jody Fishinghawk. Meredith Fraley. Here. Janelle Fulbright. Present. John Garvin. Aye. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Here. Tana Glory Jordan. Present. Lee Keener. Aye. Dick Lay. Here. David Thornton. Aye. David Walkenstein. Kara Callum Watts. Aye. John Masters. Who? We have one. <laughs> Okay, we're going to start with our reports. We're going to ask that um, the directors stand on their written reports, and if you have questions, please keep them limited. Uh, we are under some time a time crunch here. Uh, first, we have Bruce Davis and Natural Resources. I'm sorry. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right, now we're off to Bruce. <coughs> Did anybody have any questions on his report? Karen? I continue to have questions from the community and did not see it in the report. When will the buffalo arrive? And is it still oh, 80? <clears throat> it's working in and Pat Gwynn, Pat What's the latest on the bison? I don't know. I, the last correspondence I had, I gave it GD and I have okay. we, we, We're having correspondence with the, the new governor up there. And so we have submitted an application. We have to apply to get the, the bison in here. Will you keep us all sure. updated in writing? And then when will you have a hay uh, yield report? Hay hey, yield report? I get or actuals or whatever. After uh, the first cutting, which would probably be the first part of June. Okay. okay. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I believe. Uh, Bruce has a, is it PowerPoint on We have a PowerPoint presentation if we have time for it, uh, about the landfill. How long is it? How long is uh, 15 it? 15 slides, right? Yeah, okay. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. This is uh, Van Robinson and Louie Collins, our new board members. Okay. okay. Thank you. Luann Collins, Ogin Leon. You get to let God go in here. Who you're wounding that he didn't down there like he in the Yost, the Yostin. The Yostin or her colleague. Hello, everyone. Luann Collins and I are here to talk with you about our Cherokee Trust land where. A decision was made to start a landfill. If you would, let me go through the slides and then I'll take questions or we'll take questions afterwards. Maybe that'll go a little faster. Yeah. Okay, there's a, a shot of the landfill not too long ago. Uh, the elevation of the trash has exceeded that of the original mountain that was there. Cherokee yeah. Nation landfill, sanitary landfill, was first conceived in 81. And it was a collaboration between the Cherokee Nation administration at that time and the state of Oklahoma. And this no comprehensive site plan, if you're going to see it throughout the slides, was not developed. The site received its first waste in 82. And uh, they opted at that time for the operations to a non-tribal entity. That non-tribal entity didn't comply with Oklahoma rules and regulations, and citations were frequent. Uh, I have to go back and say, when the landfill was started, when it was perceived, it didn't go through the rigorous uh, 
normal permitting process that would have happened, should have happened at non-tribal lands facilities. In other words, the people that live around the landfill were never asked if they would like to have this there or not. And the process was just <coughs> talking to individuals and deciding that, yes, this trust property would be a good site. <coughs> Using tribal funds, Natural Resources Department spent 1988 to 92 bringing the landfill into compliance. Profitability is difficult to measure because Cherokee Nation was always infusing non-ledgered resources into the operation. However, it can be supported the facility's bottom line was approximately 200 to 300,000 in the positive. In 1994, EPA announced radically updated compliance standards. These standards are often referred to subtitle B. It's part of uh, 40 CFR Part 256. At that time, there were uh, a few of us that worked for the tribe, and we tried to tell the administration at that time not to start a subtitle B landfill because the regulations and what we had to do to be in compliance was going to be great, greater than what we had seen. However, the administration at that time decided to go ahead and opted to get permitted for a subtitle B landfill. The National Cherokee Nation staff that advised the administration at that time was then given through the Natural Resources Department a year to make operational functionality and regulatory compliance. The staff required as to the plan for strategy for other sub subtitle D compliance issues are NPDES, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, and the Clean Air Act. But the facility was then transferred to a standalone operation with these items never being addressed. And as you can see again on number four, a comprehensive site plan was not developed. Okay. In 2005, Management operations of the landfill are turned over to Indian Country Investments. No comprehensive site plan was ever developed. The partnership does not go well and ends in litigation in 2007. The management and operations of the landfill are then transferred to Cherokee Nation Financial Resources and then to CNB in 2008. CNB infuses significant amounts of resources to the landfill and transfers the site to the Cherokee Nation Waste Management, LLC, in 2009. No comprehensive site plan was ever developed. In 2009, Cherokee Nation Waste Management manages and operates the landfill under direction of a board. No comprehensive site plan was ever developed. Operation and finances have been problematic. Cherokee Nation has undergone numerous management paradigms since its inception, generally every three to five years. Generally large amounts of capital, both human resources and cash, are required at each managerial shift. The Cherokee Nation Sanitary Landfill is once again in need of significant resources, regardless of future plans. The Cherokee Nation sanitary landfill inadequacies and lack of functionality, which includes profitability, stem from four items. Lack of a comprehensive site plan, lack of consistent stable management, insufficient capital, and RICRA subtitle D regulation. Those regulations were really meant for the small landfills that were 
if you'll remember back then, there were landfills all over the place, county landfills, city landfills. Subtitle D was meant for those small landfills to go away. And in our case, our landfill did not go away. Okay. Determining the future viability of Cherokee Nation's landfill future involves both pragmatic and subjective analysis. Comprehensive regulatory compliance will be problematic. Any solution strategy will need to be durable. Um, number two there, especially the Clean Water Act permitting that we need at the landfill, it's not there. The MPDES permitting that we need at the landfill, it's not there. There are landfill gas issues that action is needed immediately to take care of. The number six gas vent is at 61% of LEL. And that should not exceed 5%. We're at 61% and it shouldn't exceed 5%. Eight vents are not even located in the trash itself. Due to the need for long-term stable solutions and strategies, it would be ideal for the Cherokee Nation Landfills Management Comprehensive Plan, Site Plan, would be formalized into a durable agreement, such as a tribal resolution, tribal law, to set in place what needs to be happening out there. A strategy planning group has determined that the Cherokee Nation's Sanitary landfill immediate needs include the following. Significant financial resources for capital assets and technical engineering services. This is regardless of what future plans to keep the landfill open or closed. The Cherokee Nation's executive and legislative, legislative branches of government, government need to reach agreement on a durable strategy for the future of the landfill operations. This issue should not be politicized. Cherokee Nation landfill recommendations. Complete restoration of subtitle D operations for a long time period, 10 years or more. Control closure strategy utilizing short term subtitle D operations to increase the efficiency of operations and minimize long-term costs. Number three, immediate subtitle D closure of the site, expect outlays to exceed seven million. Long-term viability of the Cherokee Nation landfill is questionable. Closure of the Cherokee Nation landfill will be a process requir requiring several years. And I would expect any capital outlays to exceed seven to 10 million. And the closure time frames will depend upon the final site plan. Retaining a complete, a competent engineering tech firm quickly is vitally important. Immediate action steps needed. Delineating funds, I would expect immediate needs to be well over 1.5 million for equipment, airspace, construction, and so on. Development of a rudimentary shutdown closure plan, rough cost estimate of about 100000 This document will delineate immediate capital and construction needs. Development of a long-term comprehensive compressive site plan for continued enhanced operations, rough cost estimate 100000 This doc document will delineate immediate capital and construction needs and operational strategies. The Cherokee Nation has a long and repeated history of failed, non-profitable operations. Current municipal solid waste regulations and industry practices are not conducive for the Cherokee Nation Sanitary Landfill to operate in a compliant and profitable manner. Immediate action on a durable strategy must be undertaken by the Cherokee Nation. Airspace is a concern as we are running out of it.
Slopes are not sustainable in the long term. Tie-ins may be needed. It's hard to see there, but there's actually a deep canyon between the one hillside on the right and the uh, where the trash is on the left. NPDES and leachate are problematic. Currently, we're receiving about 100 to 130 tons per day. And um, recently, the CEO resigned. A couple of days later, our attorney resigned. The next day, our special assistant to the CEO resigned, left, leaving us in a lurch. At this time, I'd like to thank Bruce Davis, uh, c and &E, somebody from c and &E that have loaned us staff to continue operations out there. The working environment for the staff at the landfill was horrendous. No bathrooms unless they went to a dilapidated trailer that was being used for an office sometimes. Uh, no water for the workers unless they brought their own. The first day that I went out there, I told the CEO what I saw was unacceptable. There was trash showing at every site where there should have been intermediate cover. There was not daily cover going on. It was terrible. While those issues wouldn't necessarily become an NOI, a notice of, notice of violation or NOV, it was building up to become a violation. Right, Tom? When we borrowed these people after everyone resigned, after the administrative part of the landfill resigned, I would say in the week after, there was a totally different atmosphere there. Trash was being covered daily. They were working on the slopes that had erosion and old trash was <coughs> sticking out not in just one or two places, but complete hillsides. The staff that is there now uh, with daily management is doing a great job. And I was hoping that Jackie Woodward would be here today because he's the gentleman that goes out and looks at the landfill every day. And he has been telling me on a daily basis that the landfill is looking much better. When we had our board meeting there last Thursday, I would say the landfill is 90% better than what it was the first day I went out there in February. Um, the staff that was there before, I feel like the last administration of the tribe just left them in a lurch. They have equipment that's used equipment it's constantly breaking down. We have hired a mechanic that probably has to work on the machinery on a daily basis. Keep it going. So no matter what option, and remember I promised you when you approved Luann and I to be members of this board that we would bring this information back to you because you are sole owner of this LLC, member of this LLC, and no matter what option you pick, there has to be a lot of money infused into that site. I think it's a shame that the tribe now for 30 years has not enacted the law, has not come up with a resolution to protect are people that live around that landfill. Like I said, the gas issue needs immediate attention. 
Uh, we need an NPDES permit, which Tom's office, or Tom has said, EPA will not look at our application. Okay. Have not approved it. We're a sovereign nation. It looks to me like we should go ahead and put something in place for NPDES permit. It's to protect our people out there. It's to protect the tribe. Have I left anything out? Our recommendation, as far as board members, Luann and I, to you and to the administration, is to close the landfill. If this is how we take care of something, if this is how we protect our people, I think we need to close it. It should be a control closure where we hire an uh, engineering firm to come in and tell us how we need to close the landfill properly. We will have to uh, do our testing. What's it called, Pat? Post-closure monitoring, thank you, for 30 years. However, this is trust land. It's our land. We should continue doing that. We have it for life. It's ours for life. And trust land is very hard to come by. I'd like to, take, to thank Frankie Hargis. She's been attending our meetings every time we met. Pat with the PowerPoint presentation. Bruce, like I said, let us borrow people. Tom has his staff out there every day watching. Um, and Lou Ann for working hard with me. We have been a very active board. We are hands-on. We check on those guys. We go out there. That's where we have our meetings. The board before met in Tahlequah. We have our meetings at the landfill. We go out there and have dinner with those boys that work there at Hollow Boys. One is 72 years old, and they enjoy the job they're doing. Some of them have been out there for 14 years. They enjoy what they're doing. But even they knew things were not going correctly. Things were not doing, being done correctly just because of their experience that, that they have had there. So. I'm ready for questions. I just want to say um, I have been attending the board meetings for well over a year now, and uh, Fan and Luann are have been very active. The former board, I think, visited the uh, landfill one time in the year and a half that I have attended the board meetings, and so I I really appreciate them. And um, Mr. Hoskins had his hand raised first. And we'll go from there. Well, just briefly, I first of all thank you, and Luann, thank you. I I don't know, Madam Chair, if I've ever heard a report from actual board members of one of our commissions that reflects I would have that myself. That ref, well, that reflects this much obvious work done, and that's not to diminish any of the other commissioners we've had. Uh, it's clear you all have jumped into this thing to help this council get informed. I don't know what the right decision is, but I know if this caliber of homework and advice coming from this commission, we really ought to look at your recommendation seriously. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm floored, frankly, Madam Chair, at the level of work that's obviously gone through this. Thank you. Thank you, fellow commission. That's what I was hoping the reaction would be. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, I think Dick was next, and then Karen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the honest truth. Appreciate it. It's uh, stunning. How many folks work out there if we shut this place down? And will they, some of them, continue to work there as the years go by? There are six employees out there. That's a very good question. They are the 
actual workers of the landfill. And then we have two borrowed staff. Um, if we were to go into closure, like I said, it would take a number of years to actually get it closed correctly. There will be work to do for that amount of time. After it's closed, there's the monitoring and also taking care of the landscape because there will be grass to mow. Depending on what time, type of final cover that we have, there will be some work there. But there are six. Karen. Thank you. So did the board already vote to close this and you're representing the board today and this is a recommendation to us on closure? As I promised you when we were approved, we would not make a decision. We would bring it to the council, to the administration, because that decision comes from you all. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember how it's set up legally and stuff, but I think that's, so the board itself has not said, yes, we as a group want to close this and recommend that to the council. Are you the representing? The board is Luann and I, and yes, it is our opinion, and that's what we are recommending to the board, I mean, to the council. You're the only two left on the board of directors? That's right? all that's ever been. That's all that we've had. What happened to the mayor of Tahlequah, or the former mayor of Tahlequah, and a whole bunch of other people? Their time expired. Okay, so it is just left with you two, and then, do you have a estimate then on the cost of closures? That's why. I'm not pointing at the new folks on the front row. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think I'm so We would rather not provide estimates. I have my own opinion about estimates. We should hire an engineering firm that will give us that information. I don't know how we could make a decision without knowing what those costs would be. It would be about $100,000 to hire a firm. Do we have the AG's office? Because I remember last time when all this came up, the AG's office had to be very involved because there was all the ownership. Oh, poor Elizabeth and Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was a lengthy deal to separate from Cherokee Nation businesses and Cherokee Nation government, and they were their own entity. Although we technically own the property, we don't remember how it was worded legally wise. But help me understand how this would untangle itself on the legal side. You know, we would have to, first, we would have to do everything necessary to start the closure. But we could dissolve the yeah, to dissolve that corporation all that. So is it making money right now or costing money? And this is just on the financial side. It has nothing to do with the environmentals or whether it's operating properly. It is costing money every day. Okay. Recently we met with our financial people that keep up with our expenditures, which are out of C and E. Good question. That reminds me of what I wanted to say. For some reason, uh, the board, the CEO out there made a decision back in 2009, whenever it happened, I don't know when it happened, the C&E was charging approximately $61,000 a year uh, yeah, to handle the financials, the HR stuff, all that information and for some reason the CEO or the board decided they were only going to pay like 51000 So we owed them, C&E, about 300 some odd thousand. At the time we found that out we had about a little over 600000 in the account. So we're paying our bills as they come in because as a good manager you should pay your bills. So we're now left with about $300,000 in the budget that we have. But it's costing money every day. They have to repair the equipment. So it's no longer making a profit, is what I'm hearing. It had, it's only made a profit for how many years, Pat, was it? Three years? Well, it's profit. <laughs> 
Okay, was this when the manager took the bribes and got arrested by the marshal service? Because that's I mean, when they're that. Because I looked up. I mean, so there's that, and I didn't know if that influenced because there was. That's public record. I don't know. It became a public it's issue. also public record that that was all unfounded. Okay, because I was trying to remember what happened with it. Because I remember there was a big deal about it. There was a big deal about it. He was arrested, and it was all unfounded. Okay, so there's a closure cost on this that we don't know what it is, right? And then from the Environmental uh, Protection Commission's perspective, what will we do with wildcat dumps? I think we're doing that. Sure, it will. If you the land those calls, well, we've done it before. We've done it there before. Well, it doesn't stop them if we have the Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the report. It's very eye-opening. Thank you. Thank you. Are you done? Is that all care? Yes. Thank you, Jody. Oh, I was going to address Dick's question. Dick, the six workers down there, and I remember it's probably been six, eight months ago. I was with Tina talking to the chief. And he mentioned that a couple of them was going to have to stay down there to monitor it. And he promised us that the four long-time employees that wasn't going to stay down there would be given opportunities for jobs over here. Because some of them guys who've worked down there for years and years, several of them have not even graduated the elementary. That's the only thing they know, and he promised they would be taken care of. And some of those men haven't had a raise in a very long time. And they've worked very hard. They're proud of what they do. When Luann and I first went out there, we met with every individual. We met with the CEO, his assistant, and all the men that work out there individually. And we asked them several questions, and we asked them how they liked working there, had things improved, how they, were they treated, such as that. And uh, they, they worry about their jobs. They told us what they saw was going wrong, which was absolutely correct. Uh, one of the oldest gentlemen there said, why don't they treat us like we're a Cherokee Nation? And I tried to explain, explain to him the LLC that was set up, and I said, I honestly can't tell you why they did that, because this is Cherokee Nation land. But they were being told, you're not Cherokee Nation because they would see the employees of Cherokee Nation having Thanksgiving dinner, having Christmas dinner, and being able to do this and that. And, and, they, and these are full-blood elder men. Cherokee speakers. Cherokee speakers. And they said, we don't know why we're treated like that, because we're Cherokee Nation. Aren't we Cherokee Nation fam? And I said, yes, to me, we are Cherokee Nation. So it's, they, this place is, has been ignored far too long. It's time to make decisions. Whatever decision you make will have an impact. Whatever decision you make is going to cost millions of dollars. Millions. I, I just want to say I agree with Ben. I've talked to all the employees out there, and we do have some great employees out there. Um, Jody, did you have anything else? Yeah, no. Pam, I appreciate you talking out there. When she says these are elderly Cherokee people, this is 100% Cherokee employees out there. All the employees, Pam and Luann, can sit out there and hold their meetings talking in Cherokee and never break in the English. And they have always felt like they have been treated poorly. I have had to beg, beg previous administration to supply them winter coats, to supply their boots and their overalls because other people get it, but they don't. I literally had to be able to do that much. They never even so much as get the little gift card, the $25 or $50 gift card that, you know, that we give them. These people have worked and worked and worked for us. And they've known something's been wrong for years. But they was told, hush, you need to keep your job, hush. They've known it's gone for years. And I promise you all, you all will never, other than me, you will never get two people to talk more straight and give you what they feel than these two women here. Had the mayor been on the board with you all, I'm sorry, I'm sure he'd got work in Antoine's. <laughs> these two women are going to tell you how it is. 
I very much respect both okay. their opinions. I think we chose very well. Tanya, you're next. Pam, what I'm seeing here is that you're recommending option two of our three options of control closure. Yes, ma'am. And what we need right now is probably a hundred thousand dollars. It needs to be put out for bid, but we need an engineering firm to go in there and tell us how to do a control closure. At the very least, that's what we need. We only have that three hundred thousand dollars to operate with. Mm -hmm. We're, we have poor equipment that breaks down every day. We've got payroll to meet. Do we Just have the any, normal costs of business. Do we have any current leases on any equipment? Because my understanding was there might have been um, the former management was maybe thinking about doing some leases on some newer equipment. Is there some outlay of cash that we're responsible for? The LLC is responsible for monthly on some equipment. We have a pickup, a truck mm -hmm. that was that was being used for a roll-off business that the previous CEO started. We've looked at that in our last board meeting. We voted to suspend that business because it was costing more money than it was bringing in. And I understand that truck is a lease. I don't know how they did it because I understand you folks as the council have to okay that to be able to lease or rent because of uh, I believe that was approved by the last board. Okay. <coughs> we have not had any leases come to us that I know of come to this body to be approved. Because we were told, we were asking a question, we've, we've had so many conversations, uh, about rent to own, which makes more sense to me in equipment because then you can bring the company folks in when you have problems to repair those issues uh, instead of buying things outright or even, you know, uh, used equipment. And we were told we'd have to come before the council to ask for a waiver of sovereignty or something to be able to do that. So we haven't found any documents on this truck that's being rented that says they came and did that or not. So I'm not sure. Here's what I'm saying is one, we should have these two ladies on the board four years ago when CMB uh, cuts the LLC loose, gives them $1.5 million and says you need to do what you need to do down there. Looks like our $1.5 million has been used up. Uh, it was we, actually $9 million. Oh, Lord. Uh, well, okay. Four years ago they get $9 million. They spent it down to 300,000 folks. You should have had this group on there four years ago. And we would have no, never made it through the council. <laughs> <laughs> we would have never gotten a clue. <laughs> well, what we need to do now is decide, and I make a, uh, I make a request to the chair that we put this on either a special meeting, and I think it probably does need to go on a special meeting that involves a... Uh, uh, discussion and action on what we're going to what we're going to do moving forward. You've got the recommendations. You've got your three options. Uh, this is a result, I guess, of some of the studies that have been going on. We need to we need to now. Uh, I think it's probably a special meeting that I'm requesting to just deal with this one issue. Okay, we have, we have four people listed. We'll try to make this quick and uh, then move on. Kirk, you're next. You will just wait? Okay. okay. Joe? You can pass for now. Okay. Good job. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that if we shut this down, these folks are going to be taken care of the work there. And, and did you say the CMB was charging y'all how much a year for Management services or what were the for financial services, HR services, a number of, of daily business uh, so you paid them off? We are going to pay that bill. We uh, just found out about it after the exodus. Uh, I wonder I wonder it's not my place to say. 
Well, I prefer to pay my bills. I do. I do too. Yeah. But we may. Uh, that's why, if you'll remember in the PowerPoint, we are really asking for about $1.5 to stay in operation until a decision is made on what option you're going to take. Mm -hmm. uh, Janelle. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank you for your enlightening report. Ever since I've been on the council for five years, I took my first trip out to the landfill, and it was the Grand Canyon of garbage. I'm, unless you have personally been out there and seen it, no words can describe it. Absolutely. And I feel like you've been very forthright with us, honest, given your best judgment. I think you put a lot of work into it, both of you. I'm going to thank both of you personally. And some hard decisions are going to have to be made, but you've done the footwork for us, so we've got to go forward with it. I appreciate it very much. I like to go swimming down at Bradley Ford. And a lot of us do. And we're concerned about what happened to the runoff and everybody that lives around there. So, thank you. We're going to let Jody close us out with their last question. I was going to tell everybody the dedication that Fan and Lillian has. Lillian has had five bypasses in the last month. Plus, a stay in the hospital, and she is still up here working about board this that week. And I think we all all are around. I want to thank you, ladies, and we will set a special meeting. And um, do we have a hard copy of your PowerPoint, or just do you have a copy of it, Sean? We'll get a copy and get it sent to all the council members so they can look at that again before our special meeting. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to Ginger, real estate services. We all have her report. Does anybody have any questions for Ginger? Kara? Is there more federal building? And is it really true, true about the church that you say it'll be 10 years before you participate in the development plans? I don't know. Explanation. I don't know what the Cherokee mm -hmm. Phoenix says as far as uh, you're talking about the federal building. Yeah, there are not two questions. Okay. It, so uh, be quick about it. Okay. According to 40 USC 523, in your report, it is not eligible for status. Well, I didn't know what the plan, because you reported that last month. Uh -huh. So, what's the plan then going forward on how to proceed with that? <coughs> Uh, we don't have a plan at this time. We haven't uh, sat down and discussed the plan since our last meeting. I think we can uh, get a response from the administration on what they plan to do with the building given the new circumstances. We do it before the next meeting. I'll have an answer for you. Perfect. No. Any question? Then the next one was the Cherokee Phoenix reported to be 10 years before we participated in the plan consolidation under Cobell. You know, um, as I reported in the last meeting, I think it was November the 11th, 11th of uh, 2012. They had, I believe it was 20 years, no, 10 years, in which to finish that entire Cobell settlement. And if you go to the Indian uh, Trust Settlement, you can see www.indiantrustsettlement.com. I didn't see that, sorry, I'm not reading it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else have a question? Thank you, Ginger. I have one question. Oh, <laughs> have you been getting a lot of inquiries on the I mean, yes. your office? Yes. I've so, sent a handful, but not very many. Okay. The letters you. went out May the 1st, and uh, the following Monday, yes, we've been bombarded, and uh, we can help them. We're willing to help them. Um, Every letter is different and uh, are requiring different information. If we have it, if they're eligible to get it, we can sure provide the information to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, can you most of the information that they need, though, is they have to be able to trace back to someone that had a, uh, um, I, uh, I, 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 I am account, is that correct? Not necessarily. I'd refer you to that 800 number. 
<laughs> I would just claim anything from the, regarding the uh, Indian Trust Settlement, but we have been referring everyone to the 800 number, and not necessarily. Uh, the ones I, 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 I thought the letters that I have seen said, Rent, give your, your probate decree that shows you're an actual heir to someone that had one of those accounts. And if you read on down into like, the second to last paragraph, you will see that. I believe that they will accept uh, birth and death certificates. Just send them everything that you have that next is uh, the information that I personally got. And, and I think, and I could be wrong, but I think they're trying to figure out if you're a sole heir or if there's multiple other heirs yes. that haven't, haven't made claims. Exactly. And in many instances, there might have been one heir there might, that made claims might have been 15 others out there that didn't make one. And I think they're trying to get all that information together. It, it looks pretty complex, the ones I've looked at. It's going to be hard for them to connect all the dots, so to speak. Definitely. And uh, understand that the 10-year was definitely not this, uh, the letters. Uh, that, that was the second yeah. part of that you know, the settlement. That was the third part that she asked about. That was the fractional, the fractional right. share. Fraction. That doesn't seem to concern the people near as much as the other letters Correct. on on uh, the ones that got the eight by twelves and the I think it was two documents that they got out and tried and sent in for is between eight hundred and thousand dollars. That's what I've been getting a lot of calls on. But it looks like we did everything that we could as a nation to assist them. Uh, there's some additional things that they need to connect the dots that we can't do for them. Correct. They did their part. Mm -hmm. And did your, you did it very well. I think it, you helped them to the point that you could help them. And now it's in their hands, but it's going to be very complicated to get this other information that, that they're wanting. We have a fantastic staff that uh, is there to help them. You can. Even the death certificates are hard. Because you can't just order a death certificate anymore. It's not like you used to from the state of Oklahoma. No, you have to have I think David had a question, then we'll move on. No. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Ginger. Okay, next is Tom Malkins. <coughs> Good afternoon. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so well, Thank you. How's the water plane going on? That's going. Uh, it's going very well. Um, we probably have another full year of working with our contract. Okay. Um, I think we picked about the best contract we could. We, we got impressed. two proposals on it. Uh, the other one just was nowhere near this one. When, do we, when should we expect another report as a body on it? It probably depends. We have a, you know, at the end of this fiscal year will probably be another big uh, milestone on it. And so uh, it's very lengthy, very complex. The end of the fiscal year will probably be you know, the first of next fiscal year. will probably be a good time to, to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And you heard that about the, the big help with that then. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll put it on my account. <laughs> okay. Anyone else have any questions? All right, thank you, Tom. Yes, All right, uh, Bruce, Veterans Building. Are we done yet? We're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> David Moore was over there just this last week, two or three times. David, would you come up and give a report on the Veterans Center? I did. He loved it. Because he's going to give a final ETA when it's going to be open, right? Uh -huh. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, okay. The drywall is almost. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the drywall is almost complete. Uh, we've had a few issues with some contracts. We're trying to get those worked out. So that's slowing us down a little bit. I mean, we're still shooting for the end of June as hard as we can. Uh, we're doing the concrete. Every time it's drying up, pour a little concrete or something, it rains. I'm going to complain because the last two years we hadn't had any. So. But that shouldn't hold us up inside. Uh, there's a, 
That's really the floor we're at right now, as far as the interior. Fair enough. Give it a day. We're trying to work to be done at the end of June. <laughs> okay, can they, as hard as we can. But um, I mean, there may be some stuff outside that won't be finished, but we're, we're pushing on the interior right now. And people keep asking me about the name for the facility. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Is that going to come forward? Council does that. Well, I saw some email exchanges on it, but then I didn't see anything else on it. So is that, I haven't seen anything definitely. Okay, thank you I just very much. Chuck you Nation better than <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tanya, did you have Yes, uh, I had, uh, had some information that might have been some work from there. I personally hadn't seen it there. I hadn't heard from anybody. Mm -hmm. I know so there's been some of the different buildings around. We had a couple at Redbird on the old one. They went down and took care of that. Just some flashing and copying issues. And I assume you all won't try to name it without coming through this body because I think that's a requirement. Yeah, I won't name it. Yeah, it is a requirement. Yeah. Unless you use a generic name of the Cherokee Nation Veterans Center for whatever time you'd like to. Just okay. Okay. thank you. Thank you. And you can't yeah. do that for individual. Right. You can do it for anyone, but it's got to come here. Anything else? No, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, there's uh, old business, and there's none pending, so we'll move on to new business. And we have a uh, threat rector and um, presentation from Code Red Emergency Communications. I'll just take a second to pass these out. My name is Mike Burton. Uh, I work for a company called Code Red. Uh, what we do is mass uh, emergency notifications. So we uh, provide communities, 10,000 communities um, throughout uh, domestic U.S. and also overseas that um, I guess is best commonly referred to, keep it layman, when we have problems we call 911. When places have problems, they call they use reverse 911. So what Code Red does is it's the ability to contact um, uh, different different communities, different groups, different organizations, different committees, um, in, a, in a large scale. You know, uh, while I did that, I just like to take a second, real quick, because I don't know how much time I'm going to have. And I just want to thank uh, Mr. Brett Rappender. Um Obviously, you're going to hear how I talk. I'm not from here. I'm from Boston. I came a long way to see y'all. Brett's been working on this about two years. Um, and uh, most of the things I do are city municipality, city government, city stuff like that, and that generally takes a long time. Um, but with any committee, uh, the diligence to keep at it when you recognize something that can benefit a community. Um, and the fact that he had surgery last week and he's here today, I appreciate that. So, um, What it is, uh, again, that what we do is uh, we have uh, an emergency weather service, and that's what we're probably best known for in Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, the way it works is we have a direct feed to the National Weather Service uh, in their satellite, which basically means the very second they issue a tornado slash flood, um, Victor has any type of notification that they um, they issue. Residents, community members, uh, Cherokee Nation members, whoever's in that path of that storm is going to actually receive that notification. I'm going to just pull up a slide real quick just to be a little visual and makes life a little bit easier up on the screen there. Thank you, Miss. So um, what you see on the left is uh, the, the way Code Red uses the system. Uh, the, the area, I, I don't have my laser pointer, I apologize. But the, the storm is, is moving through, and you have three polygons leaving the area on the left of the screen. That's the area that the National Weather Service said is going to be affected by this tornado warning. What's nice about this is as the storm moves, the polygons will move with it. And if you fall within those polygons, you can receive a voice, text, or an email notification letting you know there's a tornado on the way. If some of you are familiar with this, it's because we've been doing this for about 15 years and factually have saved millions of lives. And that's the truth. Um, reason being is last year at Lancaster, Texas was the one that was on today's show. That's where we got our, I guess, recent notoriety from. They received the code red warning 18 minutes before a tornado siren sounded. 
Um, you guys know better than I do being from here, um, tornado tires and what they sound like. Um, but I live in Florida now, so we, we do have here a top 10 tornado state. And uh, they're not very loud, they're not very accurate, they're indoors only. Uh, weather radio, same thing, TV, you have to be sitting in front of them. What's nice about this is it allows um, those residents that are in that storm to go ahead and get that notification. Um, what you're looking at on the right is just an, another, another system. This is generally put up for comparison. Uh, this is a state, your state system, which, uh, let me see if I can really quickly, because I, I subscribe to the state warning system, and um, just to show you a little different, uh, I don't know if any of you guys do, this is a tornado warning, and that's really small, see if I can blow it up. This is what the state of Oklahoma issues for a tornado warning. So again, if you're in your home, if you're watching TV, a child, you're on your way, you're not even at home, you're on your way from work, this is what the state of Oklahoma issues. It's very hard to understand, it's very hard to comprehend, and again, it doesn't affect um, Northern Ader County, for instance. It's not going to affect every single person that lives in the, uh, Northern Ader County. So what the Code Red system does is it gives you the option of only notifying those people that are in that area. And that's something that's essential. Um, early warning uh, and early detection, uh, giving people the time to receive that notification uh, is incredibly important. Uh, uh, that's the tornado warning. I'm, I'm touching on that because that's generally, I think, the topic around here. Um, however, again, you see you see articles that we have um, for blizzard warnings, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Look, you guys are having a heavy snowstorm. This is something that, again, the very second the National Weather Service issues that alert, which normally would get sent to a TV station, and then they have to file a report or a newspaper, and it's the same thing. Residents are going to receive that call. It's tornadoes, flash flood. Um, Winter storm warnings. The system is as accurate, uh, or so accurate, and let me see if I can pull this up a little bit, that the meteorologists from um, the National Weather Service recommends Code Red because they, they will tell you that they cannot predict an F1 tornado. Uh, I'm talking about the weather just a little bit right now because it's something that I think can benefit uh, you guys. How this was approached to me, just so you guys have the background on this, is, is um, a gentleman from Ader County had reached out to me for tornado warnings, and that had gotten pushed off the bread. We had gone down there, we did a presentation, and it was something that they were interested in. Um, like any, any municipality or local, local government, funding is always an issue, and uh, it kind of went dead in Ader because of uh, monetary. Uh, Brett was bringing it up, um, being a member of the nation, and um, he, he was talking to people, and they suggested that they look at something that can cover the 14 counties that the Cherokee Nation represents. And that's something that we can do. We have current clients that fall within these 14 counties. Uh, that utilize code red right now as a local government. Um, so this is something that not only would this benefit every every member of the Cherokee Nation who lives within these 14 counties, but this is something that also benefits um, anyone who lives in those 14 counties. Uh, and that's something that is unique, and I think is a, a, a pretty a pretty big point um, that you can reach out. This here, right here, and, and again, you guys will know this area better than I do, because I'm assuming this is close to home. That's actually a tornado warning that was issued uh, April 3rd, um, the same one that we just saw that was um, spelled out um, from the Oklahoma uh, the state of Oklahoma. So that's the polygon that's affected. So you can see what's nice about this is if you live in Fayetteville just outside that, you're not going to get that notification, um, only if you live within side. And the reason that that's important is when you deal with emergency management, my background is military and um, policing as well, when you deal with emergency situations, sometimes a false warning creates more panic um, than the actual warning itself. Um, so that's just an example of what it would look like and how specific that it actually gets. Uh, another thing I want to touch on real quick, just because I look around the table and all I see is iPhones. Um, we have an app that's unique to us that allows us um, to not only now reach, this is the one from the tornado last year, so you guys can see my phone last year in Texas that went through. On the right is every single city, um, and again, this could be a county, uh, this is what the nation represents. These are calls that were being launched um, for that tornado warning. So what's nice about the app is it's not just now covering people that actually reside within these 14 counties. It's people that are in the 14 counties. So you download this if you're traveling with it. Um, if I'm here, I'm not, I wouldn't be a member of, these, uh, of the nation of the 14 counties. I'd actually receive that notification too. And that's something free that you guys can put on your phone right now. Uh, any Android or iPhone. So that's something that also um, I think highlights, highlights the, um, 
the benefit of, of providing assistance to 14 counties, because again, it benefits everyone, not just members of the nation, members that live in the county, and people that happen to travel inside of it. Um, last thing I want to touch on, because I don't want to take up too much of your time, because uh, I can go on forever, um, is, is something that I think, and, and Brett and, and people that I've spoke to um, within the nation, I think would be beneficial. Um, just to show you a little show and tell, what you see right there, is something that is it's a web page that normally I believe this is this is the city of Dewey. There you go. Um, this is right on their website, and this is something that could be put on a county's website, the Cherokee Nation's website. This is places where people can go and register numbers, and not only because I know one of the uh, reservations about this sometimes is I don't want to get every type of warning. I don't want to be bothered with this. Right there on the on the screen itself, your members, your residents of these places will have the ability to come and just simply click if they don't want to receive it or they can customize it and pick which ones they want to get. Living in Florida, I don't have severe thunderstorms because you get them every day. Uh, but the tornado and the flash flood makes a lot of sense. So this is something where if your reservation is people not, um, not wanting to get that notification, not wanting to be bothered at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, I can tell you when it's a tornado warning, everyone that I've ever come across is very grateful for that warning. Um, but again, if they don't want the thunderstorms, you just go ahead and deselect that right there. Um, and again, this is something that can be put in, and benefit a lot more um, than just members, but at the same time, this could go on um, any affiliate uh, websites that you guys have. Uh, one other thing I want to show you, because that, that's, that's how our weather warning works. It's accurate. I don't, uh, it's very simple to kind of just do a simple Google search and type it in and see a bunch of different, bunch of different um, news articles and press releases of how uh, uh, you know, the uh, resident received the notification, or I was inside and the tornado siren didn't even work, or, or something like that. This is my internet going a little slow. I just want to bring this up because this is something that I think could also um, could benefit you guys a little bit too. Log into my account. Code Red is a mass notification system, which means it's a web-based system, so it's a website that we're on right now, and you can log into this system. Um, this can be, there's, there's usernames, there's password, and how that gets divided is um, down the road. But what's nice about this is it's a mass dialing system. So for instance, maybe, uh, just to give you guys an example, maybe a chief of police would use this in a local community um, to let somebody know about an armed suspect running around. That just happened in Wise County, Texas, with a gentleman that was shot the warden in Colorado. Or maybe it's the city of West Texas that was just, um, had the fertilizer plant explosion that's also a code red customer or the surrounding cities that use this system to notify the people of what's going on. Or um, the one that touches home to me, because you can hear my voice, the city of Boston, that just utilized the Code Red system to uh, let people know that there were two bombing suspects running around the city. This is a way to mass communicate with any group or individuals that you want. I'm showing you this here because I think uh, visually it'll make a little bit more sense. You guys, um, as a nation, you guys have, uh, I mean, you have the Marshall, I, I, again, education, um, the marshal services, the health care centers, the schooling systems. And what you see right there is some of the things that you guys have, um, just some of them. And it's a way where you can go ahead and contact stuff. So let's say, for instance, there's something going on at one of our health care centers. And I don't know um, policies and procedures, how that goes about notifying them. But, but you have the ability to go in here, go into your health care centers, click on them, go to the next left, and then actually have I don't know, maybe we only want to contact Three Rivers. Maybe, maybe WW Hastings. You have the ability to select this here and send any type of notification that you want to any of these groups. So maybe it's a snow-related emergency or a closing, or it is a tornado. Maybe it's after the fact, and that's something a lot of people don't, don't stop and take into consideration. We were warned about the tornado, but what happens afterwards? What about the street blockades because of the structure fire, because the telephone lines went down and it's starting small fires? What about the um, flood of volunteers that are coming in to help out and need to communicate with them? Here, Madam Chairwoman, Please. due to the time, are we being asked to take action today and is our emergency management endorsing this group and asking for a new budget or what's the... This is a... Uh, Brett Rector is a member of Proctor Community and he, uh, they do not have uh, a warning system in that community. I don't think anywhere in Nader County other than in Stillwell has the sirens and they're not always effective. We're asking to take this into consideration and look at putting this throughout our 14 counties. Stillwell uses 
I would ask that our emergency management team would review this and work with whoever and put it out to bid okay. for consideration. Right, that sounds good. Um, we are we are a, on a very tight time crunch because we've got to be in council meeting at six o'clock. We have one more meeting. Um, we will, uh, of course, review your um, information that you set, and I will put you in contact with our emergency management system, and uh, they can uh, get with you, and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Curtis, could you get that last, please? Uh, okay. Announcements? We have a subcommittee pack meeting immediately after this meeting. Please do not leave. <laughs> uh, most Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. We are adjourned. This is Jacob Mystery.